book of First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. I got that backwards. I was supposed to do that and then have the other, supposed to give the announcements and let Andy come up while the offering was being taken and everything. But, you know, I only started yesterday, so sometimes I get mixed up. Take your Bibles and turn to First Thessalonians if you would. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, we're going to take a couple of weeks to talk about how to find a pastor. Pastor Phil, are you going somewhere? <laughs> no. But um, as you know, when we preach through the Scriptures, I don't dodge anything, don't jump anything. We're preaching through 1 Thessalonians, and I really like the attention of all elders and all pastors and staff members. This is, uh, I'm really preaching to us today, and we're going to let the people hear. Is that all right? So all you folks that are here today, you just listen as I really am going to address um, what the Word of God has to say about what we ought to be as shepherds of the flock. So before I do that, I want to talk for a minute about the Great Commission. Now we can look at a lot of passages in the Scripture to talk about the Great Commission, but Matthew 28, 18 to 20 gives it very clearly. It says that the objective is to make disciples. Did you know that the Great Commission does not say go plant churches? <clears throat> Did you know that? It doesn't say, you know, uh, therefore go and plant churches. It doesn't say that. It says go and make disciples. You say, Pastor, I thought you were really interested in planting churches. I am. I've been involved in it for my entire ministry. Uh, it says to go and make disciples. However, when disciples are made, they're supposed to congregate for mutual edification, to carry on the ordinances and to evangelize the rest of the world. So making disciples results in planting churches. So if you could think of it like this, when the Lord gave the Great Commission, He said, go and make disciples. And the disciples, when they heard that, they understood, go and make disciples and then have them congregate and plant churches. So if you're a believer and you're not part of a local New Testament church, let me encourage you to become part of a local New Testament church. That means, yes, indeed, become a member. In fact, while I'm talking about it, let me just recommend this church. If you happen to be here today and you're not a member, Grace Church, it's not perfect, but it's healthy and it's striving to serve the Savior wholeheartedly. How many of you are members of Grace Church? Say amen. amen. How many of you recommend it? Say amen. amen. All right, good. Now, I speak to people from time to time, <clears throat> and they say things like, they don't want to be members of a local church. I just want to be a member of the universal church, the body of Christ, and I don't want to be a member of a local church. Now, let me just say this as we're getting started. Don't be offended, but the New Testament doesn't know anything about tumbleweed Christians. He said, what does that mean? Well, no tumbleweed Christians. They never put down roots, and they don't ever really bear a lot of fruit because they never really belong anywhere. Tumbleweeds don't bear fruit. They don't put down roots. It's important, brothers and sisters, to belong to a local New Testament church, to participate, to engage, to take responsibilities, and to serve God together. Now, there's a growing group of people, and I've had some of my staff talking about this last week, a growing group of people that kind of remind me of hummingbirds. And you say, hummingbirds? Yeah, they just kind of, you know, they kind of like hummingbirds that go from flower to flower, sucking the sweetness and so on from different flowers. They like to find the aspects of ministries and churches and parachurch organizations, and they like to just go suck whatever they can get out of it with a consumer mentality. And you understand consumerism is really taking over Christianity and, and churches as well. We have this thought of, I'm, I'm just looking for a church, and I want to see what they got. What do they got to offer? What do they got for widows? What do they got for young people, old people? What do they got for one-armed paper hangers? I mean, you know what I mean? I mean? They're just looking for particular things. And so they go shopping, and they try to find out what they have to offer. And so it fits very well. This hummingbird mentality fits well with the consumerism of the age, but it doesn't fit well with building and working in and building up and belonging to, taking responsibilities in and being a part of a family of a local New Testament church. And God's plan for man is in relationship with Him and with other Christians. We're physically born into families. We're also spiritually born. And when we're spiritually born, we should look for that local expression of God's family to learn and grow, to mature, and to go. And so, go. What do you mean go? Well, go where? Go to another person to make another disciple, to invite them into the fellowship and in the family, 
And I just want to give that out before I even say anything today. And so I, I'm preaching today to the pastors, but I did want to say that it is very important for believers to put roots down, become a part of, responsible in, and accountable to, and also help be an accountability partner in a local New Testament church. Do I hear an amen? Amen. amen. It's so important for us to do that. Now, before I launch into this, there's some interesting things about the people's concept of a pastor today. They have an idealistic role of a pastor. I read this, thought it was kind of humorous. Uh, some people have the thought something like this. Well, a pastor ought to be 26 years old, but have been preaching for 30 years. He ought to be tall, short, thin, and heavy set, homely, and handsome. <clears throat> he has one brown eye, one blue eye. His hair is parted down the middle. I, I, I failed this one totally. Unless you count how wide my part is. But let me just go on. So he has one eye that's blue. His hair's parted down the middle. Left side dark and straight. Right side brown and wavy. He has a burning desire to work with young people, but spends all of his time with the elderly. He smiles all the time with a straight face because he has a sense of humor, <laughs> sense of humor that keeps him seriously dedicated to his work. His sermons can summarize the Bible in 15 minutes. He and his family dress well, drive a clean car, nice car, and live in a, an average but spotless home, and they do it on a little more than minimum wage. He makes 15 calls a day on church members. He spends all of his time evangelizing the lost. He is never out of the office. And so it's kind of unrealistic, but I've heard a lot of that, to be honest. A lot of people think if a man's going to be the kind of pastor he ought to be, he ought to be as handsome as Brad Pitt. He ought to have the voice like Charlton Heston. He ought to have a mind like a Harvard scholar. He ought to have a financial skill like a New York hedge fund manager. Yet when you read the Bible here, you find that God gives a picture of a true man of God, and none of these things have anything to do with it. Interesting. One church was looking for a pastor for a while. They just couldn't seem to find one. They couldn't settle on calling one, so... On a Sunday, the chairman of the pulpit committee said, I want to read you a letter we got from a prospect. I understand your church is seeking a pastor. I would like to submit my name for consideration. I am considered to be a good preacher. I've been a leader in most of the places I've ever served, and I found some time to do some writing. I'm over 50 years of age. My health is not good, but I'm a hard worker. I have never preached any place for more than three years. Some places I had to leave rather suddenly because my ministry caused disturbances and riots. I didn't get along too well with other religious leaders in town, and they always gave me the cold shoulder. I've been threatened numerous times, been physically attacked, and put in jail several times for my convictions. If you could use me, I would be pleased to be considered. The congregation was aghast. One of the members stood up and said to the chairman of the pulpit committee, who would be interested in a man like that who is obviously a troublemaker and a jailbird? The chairman said, the letter is signed, the Apostle Paul. So, we've got to know what we're looking for. Let's stand, as we always do, let's stand and read the Word of God together in honor of His Word so that we can both read it, hear it, and say it. Let's read chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Let's read together. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spiritually treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts." For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God." You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. 
as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Let's bow for prayer. Father, add your blessing to the preaching and teaching of your word. And I pray that you would arrest my own attention and the attention of the people. Fill me with the Spirit and anoint with the Spirit those that are hearing. If there's one here today that does not know you, I pray that today would be the day that they would come to know you in faith. And I pray for this unusual and different sort of a sermon as we talk about what pastors are supposed to be and do. I pray that you would help us this morning as we look at it. Apply your word to our hearts. Let this not just be information gathering. Let this be application in our daily lives. Thank you so much, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the last two weeks, we sort of pulled the roof off the church at Thessalonica. Uh, We looked to see what kind of people they were. It was evident that God was at work at the church of Thessalonica. Paul, maximum amount of time that he would have been there with Silas and and, uh, Timothy, the maximum amount of time would have been four weeks, three Sabbaths. A lot got done in that period of time. These people at Thessalonica showed evidence of their election because they had faith that worked, love that labored, and hope that endured. They didn't just sit on their laurels. They showed that they had truly believed, turning to God from idols to serve. That is, we explained to become like slaves to Him and no longer slaves to unrighteousness and sin. And then they were to serve God, and they were waiting expectantly for His return. And I just can't emphasize that enough. Turn to God. When you turn to God, you're going to turn from some other things. You turn to God, and in the same motion, you're going to turn away from those things that had your heart captured, those things that had you enslaved. You turn to God, and it's a repentance. You're turning to Him, and you're turning away from some other things. And then you turn to Him to serve. Uh, We're going to become slaves. The Bible is so clear in Romans that to whoever you obey and whoever servants you are, you are slaves. It's Romans chapter 6. And then we studied that and talked about it, how that when we become the child of God and we join up into His family by faith, that we become His slaves. And boy, when you have Jesus as a slave master, you're really in good shape. Just want you to know that. So... But anyway, and then to wait for His return. So we don't stop working and just gaze at the eastern skies. No, we wait on His return, but we, as the Gospels say, we occupy until He comes. We stay busy until the Lord returns. And so it's so important. Now, based on the first chapter, um, Paul is going to give us lots of reasons uh, why he knew. Or the first verse, he's going to give us reasons that he knew that his labor was not in vain. Chapter 2, verse 1, once again says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. Psalm 127, verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And there's a lot of houses getting built around the world, even have a Jesus name written on them somewhere, Church of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of houses getting built Uh, But it's still a vain labor because he's not getting the glory and they're not telling the truth in many cases. So we don't want a vain labor. And that's what there in the city of Thessalonica, there was nothing vain about his labor. He didn't just come and stir the dust, make noise, gather a crowd, shout and yell and leave with nothing changed. No, uh, when he went there, there was was great change in the city. Now today, there's a whole lot of vain labor going on in Christianity. It's a lot of action, a lot of activity, lots of money being spent, but that doesn't mean a lot of people are actually becoming discipled. Even the dead church at Sardis had a name that it was alive, but it was too busy. It was, just, it was busy, but it was dead. And I can just add that busyness and buildings and budgets and board meetings do not indicate spiritual activity in any church. This church is not measured by how busy we are, how well the board meetings go. It's not about meeting the budget. Those are all important, but that's not what makes it a church that's effective for God. It is when God is number one, the Jesus Christ is lifted up, the gospel is going forth, and then something is happening. So even a church with a full calendar may not be doing much that counts. Well, we know that this church, there was some things going on. It was a city that knew that something had happened after Paul showed up in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, sooner or later, Christianity should have an impact in every place that it shows up. 
that ought, that ought to have an impact, even if it's like leaven that begins small and permeates and penetrates and grows over time, like Jesus said the kingdom of God would, there still should be an impact from the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, I don't take great pride in Des Moines, Iowa being one of those cities that is known, known for the strip joints all over this town. But this town is known as a great place for strip joints. I wish the impact of our church had an impact on those people so that the business would dry up and they'd go out of business. It is known as a haven for the, for the homosexual agenda. You know that. The state of Iowa was the first in the nation in homosexual marriage. I mean, we're known for those things. It would be wonderful if this place could become known for the impact of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ is having an impact. There are numbers of people that are coming to faith in Christ and are beginning to follow Him. It's exciting to see. So it's important. The Thessalonians knew Paul had been there. It wasn't in vain. It wasn't ineffective, unproductive, unsuccessful, useless, or futile. Man, what, a, what, a, what an indictment that would be on any church. His visit was in the power of the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, and there was evidence there was a healthy church. That's chapter 1. Now we come to chapter 2, and we're going to get started beginning in verse 2. We're going to ask this question, so how do you measure a ministry? And how do you know if pastors are legitimate? And so we expose ourselves today. We stand up here and we say, this is what we're supposed to be like. We'll let you be the judges. This is what I'm supposed to be like. This is what Pastor Jonathan and Pastor Andrew and Pastor Marty, all of our, this is what we're supposed to be like. It's what our elders are supposed to be like. So I'll let you be the judge. The first thing, the first point I'd like you to see in verse number two, it says uh, they're not to be, uh, let's see, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, jump to 2 Thessalonians. There it is, verse 2, for you know yourselves, no brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. And so the first thing we want to know is, as you'll notice, the manner of their call. Their call doesn't get canceled by difficulty. Uh, they don't just strike out just as soon as things get difficult or hard. They endure hardness. You know, in the life of a pastor, a preacher, a ministry, there should be opposition. You say, what do you mean? Well, if there's no opposition to the ministry of a local New Testament church and the ministry of a pastor in, its, in, its, in his place, if there's no opposition, then he's not saying anything, standing for anything, or doing anything. You know, that is true in your life as well. If you don't say anything, do anything, or stand for anything, people will leave you alone. But if you say something, do something, know something, stand for something, you're going to have somebody speak against you. Well, this is the way it's supposed to be for us. Luke says, woe to you when all men speak well of you. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer what? Now, that's not just for the people in Indonesia today who are being persecuted, many dragged out of their churches and killed. It's not just for the Christians in India that are being dragged out of their churches and killed. Not just in Egypt, but in the United States of America, if we're standing for the Lord, we're preaching the truth, we're behaving ourselves, we're doing what God wants us to do, it's not going to make everybody happy. Why? Because we just sang it. We're going to send the light, send out the light, shine the light, let the light shine. And when the light shines, what shows up? The evil of society, the sin of people. And it's the brighter the light, the more evident the evil. And so they endure hardness because there's opposition. Something else, their manner, is, manner reveals their call. They persevere through slander. People say stuff. And they get the, the, if, if you run around with a chip on your shoulder as a pastor, as a minister, as an elder, if you're worried about somebody saying something bad about you, you're not going to be doing it very long. Persecution and opposition will be there. The question is, what do we do when opposed? Do we wilt? Do we quit? Do we give in? Do we change our message? Not Paul, not Silas, not Timothy. They didn't change their message. Uh, those early Christians, even in the book of Acts chapter 4, when they said, look, you can't talk in this name, speak in this name, preach in this name. If you do, we're going to beat you again. And so they said, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant your servants that we would be bold to preach your word and to preach the truth and to tell. So they persevere through all kinds of things. They endure hardness, persevere through slander, and they, uh, they persist. They're persistent. Acts 16 tells about the place that these three were before they, they came to the city of Thessalonica. They had been in the city of Philippi. 
They there in that city, the people of the city and its magistrates and leadership had lied about Paul and his team. What did they do to them? Well, they seized them, they beat them, they imprisoned them, and they did it without a trial. Of course, they were innocent of all they had been charged of. They did not faint in the middle of all of this trouble, but at midnight they sang songs about the love and grace of God. Whenever they were persecuted, they just gave God the glory. And when they arrived to Thessalonica, this is after they left a, a, a Philippi, they still had stripes on, their, stripes on their back, they had shackle burns on their wrists, they had bruises on their ankles from the stocks in which they... In other words, they just went to the next city and they kept going. You know, what Paul told Timothy about enduring hardness as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, hey, guys, gals, those of you that are working and serving and serving in ministry and trying to make a difference. You know, God has never promised us that there's not going to be opposition. He's never said that it's not going to be difficult. He's never said that we'll never be criticized. He's never said that it's not going to be painful. Thank God to this point we've not suffered the kinds of things that happened in Philippi. But I'm, not, I'm believing that before my ministry is over, this very well could be the case. And so we're never supposed to just give up, give in, shut up, or sit down. We're not. And I tell you what, the more that do shut up and sit down, the more they win and the quicker it happens. So we need to be faithful and persist. Here they are. They're at Thessalonica. Well, did it go better for them there? No. The Jews incited a riot, and they began dragging people out of their homes because of their association with Paul and Silas, all in chapter 17 of Acts. They dragged people out of their homes. They ushered Paul and his team out of town, and then the church itself was attacked. And so they, had to, they suffered for all of these things, and there have been great Christians through the years. One is very familiar to you is, I'm sure many of you may have even seen that movie rich, recently about Richard Wormbrandt, Tortured for His Faith tremendous but maybe not so well known and Andy I don't know you're here you may remember Romulo Sanye who was in who was in Peru and he uh, worked in uh, the department of Ayacucho and he was a bible translator and he uh, was told very clearly if you keep translating the bible and you keep encouraging encouraging these poor people with that bible we're going to kill you and do damage to your family well, he was translating the Bible, he was spreading the gospel, and the people loved him in spite of the Shining Path and the MRTA um, rebel, uh, or organizations of rebellion against the government that were doing terrible terrorist acts before terrorism was even a concept here in America. And they were doing these terrible things, and so uh, they finally, after the Bible was actually finished and dedicated, they caught his father and cut his tongue out because he wouldn't quit preaching, and then they caught Romulo Sanye on a bus on the way back after he delivered the Bibles and they got him out of the bus, stood him up against the side of the bus and shot him dead. Bonnie had the privilege of meeting his wife surely by accident. We didn't even know it was going to happen this last year at the Bible dedication. She was sitting there and Bonnie was making conversation with a lady sitting beside her and said, I'm Bonnie Winfield and are you one of the translators? She said, well, I was married to a translator. He says, oh yeah? He says, yes, sadly he was killed by the terrorist and Bonnie's you know bling 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 she's thinking she's you're not Romulo's wife are you and she says yes I am so it was Romulo Sanya's wife sitting right there and they made friends and Bonnie cried and cried and cried as she listened to this lady tell the story of her husband and so she said to Bonnie yes but it is all worth it because the thousands and thousands of people who have the word of God and churches have been started the terrorists are gone and the word of God is going on Amen. You know, we don't give up when it's hard. We don't give up when it's hard. From time to time in our staff meeting, I'll say, guys, there's no such thing as trouble-free ministry. There's no such thing as, you know, easy path ministry. It doesn't happen. So I preach to myself. I preach to all the rest of us. A true minister holds up under opposition. Number two, the message passes close examination. Look at verse number three. Once again, in 1 Thessalonians, it says in verse 3, it says, For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God, so to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. So the message that they preach passed close examination. And I'll tell you what, our message today needs to pass close examination. You know, you hear it constantly about denominational heads getting together and talking about what changes they're going to make and what concessions they're going to make on what the Word of God says so as to not offend the people. And I heard one recently say, it was the United Methodist, if we don't start accommodating the lifestyles of our people, we won't have any people. 
well, we're supposed to preach the word as it is. I have been told, Pastor, if you keep preaching like you preach in this pulpit, you're going to empty out the church. I've told you before. God hadn't called me to fill the church. He's called me to fill the pulpit, to tell the truth, to preach the gospel, and to tell the truth and let the truth do what it does. It's amazing. The next element to examine is the actual message of the minister. What is he saying? I have to say that today we're way too impressed with how a man says something more than the substance of what he says. There's a lot of false teaching that's being taught in flashy and in very impressive ways that are devoid of truth and power. And so when we talk about the pastor, there can be no scripture twisting allowed. You just can't twist the scriptures. Write that down. No error. Paul says he wasn't going to teach anything, no matter how noble, from an erroneous application of scripture. Folks, we are not free to take the word of God. This is a living, true, active, penetrating, powerful word, but not because we change it. And make it applicable, applicable, we preach it and let the Holy Spirit do the application and work in people's lives. Because we can't change people's lives, only God can. It is so very important. And so we preach the Word. We can't twist Scripture. Paul said he wasn't going to do anything to convince anybody from erroneous application of Scripture. Peter talked about it. He says in 2 Peter 3, Our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has, what has written to you and also in all of his epistles, speaking in, uh, speaking in them of these things, in which some are hard to understand, which untaught, unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do the rest of the scriptures. The rest of the scriptures. Taking verses out of scripture, taking them out of context to teach things like universalism, which is, well, we just know the love of God is so strong and that Jesus died for all men. If he died for all men, then it's not going to frustrate the, the death of Christ, so he's going to save everybody. In the end, love wins and everybody's going to be saved. That is a gross twisting of the Scriptures, and it happens all the time. No Scripture twisting is allowed. The recipe for a cult is the removal of a Scripture from its context and making it teach whatever you want it to teach. And brothers, you that are preaching and teaching, and even if you're, you're in our docent community and you're teaching in classes and you're teaching, let me just say to you, uh, Bible bouncing is really not a good idea. You say, what's Bible bouncing? It's when you come up with an idea about something you would like to teach and say, and you get a concordance or you get on, you get on your computer and you find every place in the Bible that the word you're looking for is mentioned, you bring all those verses together and teach them, boy, that is a recipe for disaster. Because every verse of Scripture is seated exactly where God wanted it, and the context rules over what the application of any verse is. There's one exception, is the book of Proverbs in those short pithy, pithy sayings that are there that stand alone. No twisted teaching. No twisted teachers either. No twisted teaching, no twisted teachers are allowed. No impurity. The whole of 2 Peter talks about this, but 2 Peter chapter 2, 18 says something interesting. When they speak, that's these false teachers, twisted teachers, they speak great swelling words of emptiness. They allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption, for by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. And so you don't take the scriptures and twist them, and you're not, you can't be a twisted teacher in the process. You can't be a person that's trying to profess one thing and live something that's completely different. The greatest qualifier for a message to be received outside the anointing of the Holy Spirit is the pure and righteous life of the messenger. So, men, we need to pay attention. No twisted tactics allowed, no manipulation. He said it there, he used the word no deceit, no lying. The Bible cannot be used to promote an agenda that is not God's own purpose. No, no one, none of us should be hijacking any verse of Scripture to defend a sin or to promote a cause that God has not declared. I'll even go further. Paul goes on to say that he wouldn't even use the Scripture or preach or teach to trick people or by clever speech to trick people into a place of making a false profession. 
There's all kinds of evangelism systems that you can work with people and they teach you just the phrases just the words just the trick things to say when somebody says something they'll give you something to say back to put that person in a corner so they look foolish that's trickery that's craftiness that's not the working of the holy spirit convincing and convicting people in their heart hey guys we don't trick people even with the scriptures it's honest straightforward teaching and preaching no twisted tactics let me move on number three the motives live up to spiritual standards look at verse number five first thessalonians chapter two and verse number five for neither at any time do we use flattering words as you know nor a cloak for covetousness god is witness nor do we seek glory from men either from you or from others when, when we might have made demands as apostles of christ so the motives, their motive for what they were doing, it lined up to the spiritual standards. It lived up to spiritual standards. What did he say? He said they didn't use gaudy words. Gaudy words. He didn't come preaching to impress. He uses the word a little bit later, flattery, to gain people's confidence. And there's no point in being outright offensive when we speak to people, but buttering people up, um, the buttering people up makes people start asking why and what do you want next? Whenever somebody comes along and starts to lay it on thick, you better hold on to your wallet. King Darius, you say, what did he have to do with it? Well, just listen. King Darius in the Old Testament, he didn't see him coming when they came to him, these guys buttering him up. King Darius lived forever, you know, and isn't your word the last word on everything? Yes. Well, let's make a law that since you're so great and so wonderful, let's make a law that nobody can talk or pray to any other God for a period of time, and then you will be greatly honored in front. Well, he was so flattered. He wasn't paying attention. He signed the edict, and guess who ended up in the lion's den? Daniel, his best confidant and best counselor, and the person that was the person who loved him and cared about him and helped him the most, ended up in the lion's den because he listened to flattery. How about this fellow? Do you remember King Herod? King Herod went and he spoke. And he spoke up in one of the cities on the coast, and he said to them as he was speaking, they said, oh, this guy's amazing. Listen to his oratory. While you're so, they clapped, and they yelled, oh, you're so wonderful. You have the voice like the speaking of a god. You're just like a god. He ate it up. He ate it up, and he was eaten up of worms. Those people weren't taken with him and flattery. They weren't. They just wanted him to open up the stores of food once again so that they could have food and to have their, have their old system that they had before. So they used flattery. Boy, watch out when it's flattery. And that's what they were trying to do. So the questions are, do, do we preach to impress? Paul didn't. In Corinth, he specifically said this. He didn't preach to impress. He didn't preach with pride and with confidence. When he preached in, comp in, in Corinth, he said he preached with fear and trembling. His knees were knocking together when he would stand to preach. And he would preach without enticing words. Another one, do, they, do we preach for good comments? Do we preach so people would say, good sermon, well done, good preaching. Does that, well, we got to hear that and we feed on that? If you keep doing that forever, we'll end up saying things just to be commented just to be commended does he like to preach the preacher because he likes to be seen in front of a lot of people is there, is there some is there some you know uh, affirmation of him as a person and a preacher that he gets to stand in front of everybody and have everybody listen to him or is it that he wants to stand there and break the bread of life and give it to people to build them up for the life that they face for the ministry that they have in front of them and for and for the battle that they're going to face with sin in their life with sin and with the devil in their life what is the purpose so very important he's not greedy either so he's not gaudy with his words and he's not greedy in his heart when we use the ministry as a means to enrich ourselves we reveal our real goal Balaam might as well just join his club Balaam was a prophet for hire you know I mean they, the, the, the Balak kept giving him more and more money to keep cursing the people of God and the more money he made the more God opposed him and stood up against him well we're not supposed to be prophets for hire so important. We have a lot of Balaams today. Paul warned in Timothy, he said, if anyone teaches otherwise and doesn't consent to the wholesome words, even the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which accords with godliness, he's proud, knowing nothing, obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reveling, and so on, useless wranglings of men, corrupt minds of destitute of the truth. They suppose that godliness is a means of gain from such withdraw yourself. 
Greed was particularly the besetting sin of the Pharisees. Jesus said so. The Pharisees who were lovers of money, they heard everything he said and they derided him. Jesus warned about, the, about falling into the money pit, into the money trap and letting greed take over their hearts. And the Pharisees laughed and mocked at him because they loved money. And so there must be a lot of Pharisees in the ministry today we got to watch. Folks, please learn to follow the money. Whether you're talking about global warming in politics or whether you're talking about feeding the hungry in ministry, learn to follow the money and find out what's happening. I've always tried to, I've always tried to understand this. If we're having global warming or climate change in the world, I mean, the world's messed up, how does sending money to somebody who's telling me about it help change that? Oh, let's raise taxes because there's global warming. Let's raise taxes because there's global, to, global cooling. Let's raise taxes because nothing's happening. I mean, you just, you know, so this is the way it is. They're not gaudy, they're not greedy, and they're not glory hounds. We're talking about the ministers. Did you ever hear a speaker where he's the hero of all of his stories? Did you ever work with someone who had to have the credit? At the end of the day, they had to say, well, that was because of me, or I did this or did that, or it was my choice or my decision that really led to that good thing. Did you ever work with anybody like that? I add to this the person that has to remind you continually of their position or their education or their title. Watch out for glory hounds. You know, David was quite the fella, but he didn't talk about himself. He talked about his mighty men. He pointed to them who helped him. Daniel, he was the one that actually interpreted the dreams. But what did he say? We we have received this interpretation, I and my friends. He gave credit to other people. Four, the methods. The methods reveal a shepherd's heart. Look, if you would, once again at verse number 7. It says, But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So, affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives because you became dear to us. The methods reveal a shepherd's heart. This may be the most revealing of everything we've said so far this morning. How does the minister conduct itself or the ministry conduct itself toward its members and guests? Do we have an attitude that lords it over the flock? Does he look to them as his servants? Does he look to them as his responsibility and purpose and reason for being? Or are they just there to serve him? So important. A minister cares for his people, these verses 7 and 8, like a nursing mother. What a beautiful picture. Like a nursing mother. And I don't think you could draw out an illustration that would be more apt to the kind of ministry that pastors and elders ought to have toward their people than when Jesus, or when Paul points out right here that I cared for these people at Thessalonica like a nursing mother, like they were tiny babes in Christ, and I helped them like a nursing mother. So my treatment of them was gentle. There was gentle treatment as cherished people. He was gentle in his dealing with them. And I just have to say, pastors and elders, the sheep of our flock are not a means to an end. They are not our personal stepping stones to bigger and better assignments. We are not to use people. Now, please listen to this. Men, elders, pastors, we're not supposed to use people like a carpenter uses his tools. That's not what we do. Listen to Ephesians 2.19. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. So we're working with people who become the habitation of God. This church together, both individually, you're the house of the Holy Spirit, but as a people, we are the habitation of the Holy. This is the place where God wants to shine. And so we don't work with people as if they're a screwdriver in our hands, if they're a pair of pliers in our hands to accomplish this, even if we're recruiting people to help us in ministry. It's a privilege to have volunteers. And if you're a staff member here, you do know this is a church of volunteers like very few. Let's give God the glory, by the way, for a church full of volunteers. Amen. It's amazing, amazing what God does here at this place. And so 1 Peter says, we, the, we are living stones. You are living stones being built up into a spiritual house. Listen to these words. A holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus. Pastors, here's what we're doing. We're preparing people to be priests. 
We're preparing people to be the representatives before God, for God, and for the people so that there's somebody in this world, in the daily life, in the workplace, in the neighborhood, wherever we are, we are preparing people to be the priesthood of God in front of the world. So we are not supposed to lord it over people. Gentle treat, but then there's genuine affection. He looks at them as his own, not like a hireling who runs off when there's danger or difficulty or financial lack. Genuine service, not, not watching the clock for the end of the shift. Clock watching, trying to get out the door as fast as we possibly can but rather like a nursing mother. Wouldn't that be something if mom said, after she finally has put in enough time and gets a little bit tired, and the little fellow that she has, you know, been nursing, taking care of, and all that stuff, what if she said, well, that's it, I'm done, end of the shift. I'm done feeding, changing, nursing, tending, watching, and holding until another time somebody else pick it up. I'm just done. Like a nursing, does a nursing mother do that? Can't do that. Why? Because moms make sacrifices. Moms show patience. Is there anybody more patient than a mother? Moms show patience. Mom provide nourishment. They feed the little infant the milk. And what do pastors do? But like, like moms with nursing children provide the milk of the Word of God that they can grow thereby. Moms give protection. You get the picture? A good pastor is going to hold the individuals of his flock close, sacrifice time. Not, not, look, folks, I'm preaching to us. You're listening one day you're going to replace me, and when you do, make sure you're looking for a man of God that has the, heart, has the people at heart and not his progression through the ministry. I used to get a lot of invitations to go preach. My first five or six years, they came in all the time. And I said, no, I, I, have, a, I have a church to pastor. No, I, I have a flock to feed. No, I, I mean, God's given me a great responsibility. Guess what? Nobody knows me, and nobody's asked me to go anywhere. And you say, well, you just, you know, maybe you're not very impressive. Maybe not. But I am dedicated to this flock of people, this group of people. I'm dedicated to this city, to reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ and building up those who come to faith in him. This church. This church. Moms make sacrifices, show patience, provide nourishment, give, give protection, and they're giving their life. And anything else is a hireling and a, and a pastor, he can't think about punching a clock. When the, when the call comes and there's been a car wreck, the hospital is the next place he needs to be. Next, a minister cares for his people like a concerned father does his children. Verses 9 to 12, look at it. He said, well, you're just really giving it to yourself this morning. Well, is it in the Scripture? Am I dreaming or am I just reading what the Word of God says Paul said about himself? Here it is, verse 9. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we have behaved ourselves among you who believe. Now, as you know, we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So a minister carry, cares for his people like a concerned father does his children. So it's like a nursing mother in the tenderness and gentleness and affection. But it's like a concerned father in the preparatory works. And so this concerned father, he is a burden to them, but he works for them. Verse number 9, he sets the example of industrious discipline. And I was a missionary. I love being a missionary. But not everybody in missions is a self-starter. Some people have got to have a structure. And I just want to tell you, if you're thinking about being a missionary, you're thinking about going into the ministry, you need to be that person that the alarm goes off in the morning, you get up out of bed and you get at it. And if you don't know what to do, you ask somebody to tell you what to do. You find some work to do. You study the Bible. You, you don't just glide until the phone rings and somebody, and don't just wait until Saturday to get the sermon ready for Sunday. He's not a burden to them, but he works for them, and he sets the example of an industrious discipline. And without discipline, I just want to say it, without discipline, there is not, I can't name 10 good things in life that have happened in my life if I did it without discipline. It takes discipline to get anywhere. He worked hard, Paul did. 
He's not a burden to them, but he works for them. And then he's not a burden to them in his behavior. He is not perfect, but he is blameless. What does that mean? He doesn't give the church. He doesn't give the world. He doesn't give the devil. He doesn't give the skeptic. He doesn't give people a point of reference, an opening in the armor. He doesn't live a life of laziness. He doesn't live a life of dissipation. He doesn't allow himself license to sin. He's not a wine bibber. He's not a drinker. He's not a sloucher. He doesn't give anybody reason to blame him in his life. He loves his wife. He loves his children he loves the church he loves the word of God and that's what he does and he doesn't give a place for the devil to say look at that guy now listen this is so very important and this is what Paul is saying look you know what we were like among you we behaved ourselves we weren't perfect but we were blameless it means nothing sticks to him all kinds of accusations might come but nothing sticks He's balanced in exhortation and encouragement, not only correcting but comforting. He urges his people to walk a worthy walk with a balance of exhortation and encouragement. So he works tirelessly. He walks blamelessly. He speaks truthfully. His words edify, instruct, correct, and encourage. Look at verse number 12. The goal is growth, maturity, equipping, and preparation. It's not just to survive in life but so that his people can be effective in life as witnessing believers. This, this, is, uh, this is like a verse that every pastor ought to have emblazoned on his forehead. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect or mature in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor striving according to the working, according to his working, what works in me mightily. So God is mighty to work, but his workers work mightily. Amen. We don't just hope things happen. Uh, from time to time, I hear somebody talk about organic ministry. Well, I just hope things happen. You know, we just sort of set up a nice situation, and we have fellowship, and we, we just don't do anything intentional. We just wait on the Holy Spirit to work. Good luck. Him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man. Ministers are to be the people with beautiful feet. Where did that come from? This is Isaiah 52, 6. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he who speaks. Behold, it is I. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace who brings clad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. This is Isaiah as he is forecasting the deliverance of the people in the future. This is before Isaiah 53, and you know what happens there. This is Isaiah chapter 52, and he is prophesying and forecasting the return of the people. He's, he's prophesying that they're going to be released from their captivity in places like Assyria, in places like Babylon, in places like Egypt. They're going, to be, they're going to be released. And so you have these heralds that run ahead. They run ahead to bring the news. And as they run, they have to run on these, on these rocky, craggy areas. Maybe when they started out, their sandals were in good shape, but by the the time they get there they're running and they're running and they get there and their shoes are worn out and they are tired and their feet are bleeding and they're just they're falling they're falling as they, and they just keep they get up and they keep running and they finally get there and they look the herald looks out off of the off of the side off of the, of the wall of the city and they say look here comes one that's announcing good news here comes some people with beautiful feet because they're the people that strive and work and don't give up and they keep going and they work their fingers to the bone and they work their feet to the blood and they just keep going with the good news because good news is what the world needs. You know that? These are people with beautiful feet. <laughs> My uh, homiletics teacher's name was Johnny Pope and he was an amazing, amazing preacher. When he was a little boy in his teenage years, he started to go astray. He told the Lord he would be a preacher when he was 15. It was the same age I was when God called me to preach. And as he was going through his older teenage years, he started to 
started to hedge on his commitment. He started to walk away from the Lord. He started to get involved in things that were wrong. He had a terrible accident in a car. He was in the hospital, and he was in terrible shape, and he almost died. And he was laying there in the hospital, and the tubes and the equipment was on him. Julian Pope, who was his father, walked into the room and got down beside his bed with his shoes on the floor and he prayed over his shoes and he said but God this is the one that I've been praying to have beautiful feet and Johnny Pope taught a lot of us to preach and he preached the gospel a flaming evangelist amazing amazing man of God but he had beautiful feet And I just want to say to all of us ministers, preachers, teachers, elders, it is a great honor to have the call of God on our life. It is a great responsibility as well. Let's don't take it lightly. Would you bow your heads for prayer? How do I end a sermon like this, Father? Little did I know that 40 years after starting, I would still be doing this. There is no recall from this task. There is no, let me let you do something else from this task. Thank you so much for the Apostle Paul. Thank you so much for his example. Thank you that he pressed on in spite of the opposition at Philippi, Thessalonica, Athens, and everywhere else. He pressed on and the gospel came to Europe. And the gospel took root in Europe. And then after a few hundred years, Nearly 2,000 years, the gospel jumped the ocean, came to the United States. And because of his tenacity, faithfulness, and your hand on him, we receive the gospel. I pray that all of us as pastors, ministers, elders, I pray that we would look at this great privilege that you've given us. And I pray, Father, that we would have this attitude toward the ministry of being humble servants with wonderful news that are ready to stress ourselves to the max in order to make sure that the Word of God goes forth to build up the people, to prepare them for life, to equip them for ministry, to help them be ready to share the good news in this world. And help us do it faithfully until you come. I want to just stop by asking you if you'll do us a favor. How many of you say, Pastor Phil, this week especially, I will pray for the ministers at Grace Church to grab the task to be faithful to their calling. And for us to be able to encourage them when we can. Pastor, I'll pray. Would you just raise your hand up? I'll pray. Father, you see their hands. Let it be so. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.